We sang a, a song this morning, even in the fire, I'm alive in you. Even in the fire, I'm alive in you. You are strong in my brokenness. I think that uh, often in life, it's a lot easier to believe those words when we're out of the fire instead of in the fire. I, I believe that it's a lot easier to sing songs of joy when we're on a mountaintop instead of the desert. I think that it's easier to praise God from the balcony of a cruise ship than from a hospital bed. I think it's a lot easier to uh, send out a tweet, God is so good, on the day that you received a promotion instead of the day you received a pink slip and you're gone. I think it's a lot easier to smile and have joy and be satisfied in God when you know, you've scored the winning goal instead of on a day when your mistake costs the team the whole game. I think that it's just so much easier to praise God on a mountaintop than in a desert. But what we're gonna find today is no matter where you're at and what, what circumstance you're in in life, we're gonna find this lesson from David. We're gonna find that our joy should not be connected to our circumstances. Our joy will just ride like a roller coaster as long as our joy and satisfaction in life is connected to our circumstances. We are at the mercy of everybody else and all of our circumstances if our joy is tied to our circumstances. But if our joy is tied to a God in heaven who transcends our circumstances and who's working out his purposes no matter what kind of a valley we're in, then we can have joy that transcends all of life. And that's what we're gonna learn today. David is on the run. He was anointed to be the second king of Israel when he was about 15, 16. For about three, four years, he served as a court musician to King Saul, the first king, who was kind of a madman. He was an armor bearer. He was a warrior. He was in Saul's court. He was like a son to Saul, but Saul was jealous of him. So around age 20, David is driven out of Saul's court and he's on the run. And he won't be anointed, he won't actually become king until he's 30 years old. So he's on the run for 10 years. He's in the deserts, the southern part of Israel, living in strongholds and caves and, and running from this hideout to that hideout for 10 years trying to stay alive. And yet it's during those years that he writes nine of his top hits. The Psalms, the Hebrew word psalm means song. And David wrote something like 78 out of the 150 songs in the book of Psalms. And nine of those, five he wrote in our section from last week, four he wrote in our section from this week, he wrote songs from the desert, which proves to me it's possible to have my joy tied to something bigger than my circumstances in life. And that's kind of where we're headed today. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know uh, if you're in a trial or you're in a desert, you're in a place where you've you failed, you think you've lost everything or whatever, you're gonna find that you can go through the desert and still sing a song to God. God, we again just pray that you would speak what is true. I pray right now that you would give our minds and hearts the ability supernaturally to respond to you, to receive your word, to concentrate. God, would you drive out distractions? I know the evil one would wanna just keep us distracted this whole time. So we won't hear your word and receive it, but I pray you'd give us supernatural ability to concentrate, to receive, and to receive your word like good soil. We just commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So David, man after God's own heart, uh, one and a half books of the Bible is about David, one of the great characters in all of Scripture. If you want to learn about David, he's an excellent study. If you're a young person, you want to learn about David, Read his early life from 15 to 30. I mean, read young David. If you want to learn about middle-aged life and what to do and not to do, read David. If you want to learn about old age and the mistakes you can make toward the end, read about David. He's in Scripture, one of the major characters, because his life shows us so much. This particular section we're in right now starts in 1 Samuel 23, and it starts with a, a, an act of tremendous betrayal. 
David is in the southern part of Israel. He's running from Saul. He's out in the deserts, just barely trying to stay alive with about 600 men with him and on the run every day. There's a city by the name of Kila in southern Israel that was being attacked by the Philistines. And so David has this desire to play the hero. I mean, I'm going to be the next king. Maybe I should start showing it now by going and delivering Kila. But I want you to watch what David does. Instead of responding to the logic, responding to the hero impulse, you know, instead of responding and just playing the hero, watch what David does as this whole section opens. It says, David inquired of the Lord. He inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack the Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and deliver Kila. Now watch what happens. David's men, they have a different set of words for him. David's men said, behold, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Kila against the Philistines? So what's David do when his men try to talk him out of it? He goes back to God. Then David inquired of the Lord once more. And the Lord answered him, arise, go to Kila, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. Here's the key to this whole period is David is really tight with God during this period. He's talking to God. He's asking questions of God. And I love this here because he doesn't just respond to the natural impulse, I should go play the hero. I could set myself up to be the next king right here if I deliver Kyla. He doesn't. He inquires of God. And then even after that, when his men say, his friends, his buddies say, don't do that. You don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. Don't do that. What does he do? He goes back and asks again. Take a lesson right there. God, he's connected to God. He's praying to God. He's not just taking the advice of his friends and his buddies, not just following logic. He's really searching out and seeking God's will in every situation. Now contrast that with King Saul, who's up at, at his home in Gibeah. Saul hears that David is going to rescue the city of Kilah. Now watch how Saul tries to determine God's will. When it was told Saul that David had come to Kilah, Saul said, oh, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself up by entering a city with double gates and double bars. Saul reads the circumstances and tries to discern God's will by looking at the circumstances. He uses his head, he uses his logic. Kyla, double walled, double gates. David's in Kyla, he's locked in. I've got him and God has given him to me. Do you see how Saul's trying to read God's will? He's not praying, he's just looking at circumstances. He's saying, well this opportunity here, that must be of God. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't think that opportunity grants you permission, that just because somebody's offered you this, well, that must be God's will. Or they've offered you this promotion, or they've offered you this place, or this spot, or this raise, or whatever. Opportunities does not constitute the will of God. You gotta take those opportunities and bring them before God and bathe them in prayer. I, I've, I give you in your notes a quote from the Life Application Study Bible. Page 345 in your notes, it's in a box there. I quote it in full, it's so good. Not every opportunity is sent from God. Not every opportunity is sent from God. We may want something so much, and this is the key, we may want something so much that we assume any opportunity to obtain it is of divine origin. As we see from Saul's case, however, this may not be true. When opportunities come your way, double check your motives. Do a gut check, do a heart check. <laughs> Make sure you're following God's desires, not just your own. You may want something so badly that when an opportunity comes to get it, you go, oh, see, God's given it to me. Opportunity does not grant permission. Write that down. Opportunity does not grant permission. You know what opportunity grants you? The opportunity to pray. To bring it before God and say, is this of you or is this of not? David is praying. Saul is just reading the opportunities, and they are as far off as one, one guy's following God, the other guy's so far off, it's not even funny. So, so what happens is, David delivers Kyla from the Philistines. Now David hears that Saul is coming to get him in Kyla. So what do you do if you're David at this point? You hear that Saul is coming, you've got a double-walled, double-barred, gated city, and you've just rescued these people from the Philistines. So what does logic tell you? I'm safe here because the city is strong and the people are for me. The people will protect me. I've just played their hero. I've delivered them. Of course, they're going to fight with me against Saul. Not what David does. Look what David does again. Then David said, O oh Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard for certain Saul is seeking to come to Kilah to destroy the city on my account. 
Will the men of Kyla surrender me, surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down, just as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell me. Tell me. And the Lord said, Saul will come down. In other words, David doesn't just depend on the report he's heard. He takes the report to God and says, what's your report on the report? And God says, my report on the report is the report is right. And then David says again, I, I ask you now, will the men of Kyla surrender me when he does come down? And God says, they will surrender you. Can you imagine David's mind when he's going, you're kidding me. These guys are going to hand me over to Saul when I just rescued them from the Philistines. Can you imagine the sense of how illogical that is? What a betrayal that is? And yet it was true. David didn't depend on his peers for his wisdom. He didn't depend on the report, Saul coming. He didn't depend on his logic. He didn't depend on the way people were acting toward him. I mean, they might, might have been acting friendly, but they were ready to betray him. He prayed. We've only gone a few verses into this chapter 23. David has prayed four times. Four times. What's that tell you about staying tight with God in life, in trouble, in a desert? Pray. Pray. Don't depend on your logic, your peers, your reports, your circumstances, your intuition. Don't do it. Pray. Pray. And then pray especially when other people are talking to you and they're telling you, Let, let's do this, let's do this, let's go over here, let's do this. This is right, this is what I hear. Pray, just pray, take everything before the Lord in prayer. It says in the book of James, chapter one, if you need wisdom, and who doesn't? If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. So take a lesson right off the bat, pray. Pray about everything, in all things pray without ceasing, scripture says. So David is warned by God that the inhabitants of Kilo will betray him. So off he goes with his 600 men down into the wilderness of Ziph, the southernmost part of Israel, an absolute desert. Here comes the first song. Here comes the first song that he writes in this period. Song number 63. Camille read from it earlier. But just listen to these words and, and be thinking in your own mind, what song would I write in this situation? I've been betrayed by Kila. I'm on the run. I'm on the run from Saul. It says David stayed in the wilderness in the strongholds. He remained in the hill country in the wilderness of Ziph. It says Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. What song would you write when you're down in the wilderness, in the strongholds, in the hill country, and Saul's after you every single day of your life? What song would you write? Psalm 63. Listen to these words. You get insight into David right here in his walk with God. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. In other words, God, as thirsty as my tongue is for water, my soul is for you. He's thirsting for God. And then he says, I've seen you in your sanctuary. I've gazed upon your power and your glory. And you're wondering, well, how did he do that? How did he see God in God's sanctuary up in heaven? He'll tell you in a moment. He, he says, your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I praise you as long as I live. I lift up my hands to you in prayer. And by the way, all through scripture, even in the New Testament, it says in 1 Timothy, I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands. So guys, when you see people lifting up their hands, don't think, wow, they're the strange ones. The strange ones are the ones who are not lifting up their hands. Because in scripture, even David would lift up his hands in prayer. It was a way of just calling out, just reaching out to God. And that's what he's doing in these desert days. He's lifting up his hands to God. And then listen to this. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. Songs of joy? I'm in a desert. I've been betrayed by Kyla. Saul's after me every day. I've got 600 men with their wives and children. I've got no place to go. The promise of God's not coming true. How can you sing songs of joy? I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. That's how he beheld God in the sanctuary. Because at night, he's lying there thinking about God, meditating through the night while everybody else is sleeping. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. That's his song he wrote during these days in the desert. You can write songs in the desert. You can. 
if your joy is not tied to your circumstances, but to your God. I sing for joy, not in the shelter of this cave. I sing for joy, not in the beauty of this desert. I sing for joy, where? In the shadow of your wings. And here's what I learned from this first song, is my joy in life is way too tied to my circumstances. I admit it, I'm a complainer, I'm a grumbler, I don't know if it's just me, but I mean, life's gotta be good for me to sing the right kind of song. When life's this bad, and you know, it's a long stretch, and a prayer hasn't been answered, and you're struggling, I, I start complaining, I start grumbling, and I'm convinced it's a sense, it's, it's a spirit of entitlement. That's what I think it is. Well, God, you know, I'm doing this over here. Can't you just lift your little pinky and solve this problem over here for me? God, I'm like, you know, I'm waiting to be king faithfully. Don't you think you could just take Saul out like that? You just have to flinch your pinky? And I get that. And, and yet David, his joy was tied not to the desert, but to the God in the highest heavens. And I, I, the apostle Paul talks about this in Philippians. In the book of Philippians, he's sitting in a Roman prison cell writing to the Philippian Christians. And once you know, in the book of Philippians from a Roman prison cell, he writes the epistle of joy. More references to joy in Philippians than any other letter, and he's in a prison cell. And in chapter four, Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of having an abundance and suffering need. Learning the secret of tying your joy to God, not to your circumstances. That's a huge lesson I need to learn. I haven't learned that secret yet. Maybe I'll learn it before I'm finished, but it's a big one. Joy that transcends our circumstances. David had that, Psalm 63. The next thing that happens in chapter 23 is his friend comes back to him, Jonathan. Jonathan, the beloved brother-like friend, the son of Saul. He's about 30, David's about 20. And this guy just keeps showing up. This is the third time Jonathan has come to David. And now, here's a true friend. He seeks David out in the desert. He goes to David, he finds David, and he encourages him. This is a true friend, listen to this. And as you, as you listen to these words, ask yourself, do I encourage other people like this? And then ask yourself, is there anybody in my life that encourages me this way? Listen to what Jonathan does. He, he goes to David, he finds him, then he says, do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul, my father, will not find you, and you will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you, and Saul, my father, knows this also. And the two of them made a covenant. This is the third time they've renewed their covenant relationship before the Lord, and David stayed at Horus while Jonathan went to his house. Isn't that beautiful to see this guy coming to him? Yes, yes, I know, we can get our encouragement from God alone, but isn't it nice every now and then to have a friend to come along like that and pat us on the back and help us through? And maybe you can be that for somebody. Maybe there's somebody in your life right now you're thinking of that God saying, you know what, I could use you to encourage them. And maybe you need to write a note this week if they're far off. Maybe a handwritten note even, or maybe a phone call, or maybe... You're the person that, that needs to be encouraged. Who are the people in your life that you've given permission to come this close and speak into your life? We need this kind of encouragement. Jonathan was a friend like no other. And of all the words he spoke to David, only one line didn't come true. And that was the line, I will be next to you. Because Jonathan so hoped that someday David would be king and he would be his right-hand man. And it, it didn't turn out that way. It was not God's will. Jonathan would die in battle with his father and his two brothers by the end of 1 Samuel. But what a tremendous friend. Who can you encourage like, like that this week? So, so Saul is after David. He's chasing him around the southern region. And David's now in a place called the wilderness of Ziph. And the men of Ziph decide to go to Saul and betray David's exact location. And so what they do in chapter 23 is they go to Saul and they say, they give three coordinates. This is almost like, you know, the coordinates you'd need for a, an exact missile strike, a drone strike. In one verse in chapter 23, they say, he's in this location, in this hill, by this cave right there. And they give the exact coordinates. They betray him. And then Saul, it says, goes to that place and he goes on one side of the mountain and David and his men go on the other side of the same mountain. And David is hurrying to get away from Saul, 
For Saul and his men were surrounding David and his men to seize them. And you look at this and you go, wait a minute. If, if you're David and you're, you're, you're tight with God, isn't he going to provide a lot of distance between you and your troubles? Isn't God going to make it a little bit easier, a little more comfortable? Isn't God going to make it easier for you? No, not at all. This is one of the mysteries of, of the life with God is he will allow He'll allow the enemies to get close. He'll allow the trouble to come near. He'll test our faith. He will bring the trial right to us. And here, he brings Saul to the other side of a mountain, and Saul's about to surround him. And then at the last minute, it says that a messenger came to Saul and said, hurry, come, for the Philistines have made a raid on the land. So Saul returned from pursuing David and went to meet the Philistines. Therefore, David called that place Rock of Escape the rock of escape, my brush with death, narrow escape, barely made it out alive. That's what he calls that rock, the rock of escape. What song would you write at your rock of escape? What song would you write right there? When people have betrayed you, the wilderness of Ziph, they betrayed you. The inhabitants of Kyla betrayed you. Saul has just barely almost captured you. What song would you write to God at the rock of escape? Song number 54. Psalm 54, save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your power. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen against me. Violent men have sought my life. They've not set God before them. Behold, God, you are my helper. The Lord is the sustainer of my soul. He will recompense the evil to my foes. God, you destroy them in your faithfulness. He writes a song about God being greater than his enemies. Could you write that song? Could you write a song called God is bigger? God is greater than my enemies? That's how David is feeling when Saul almost has him, but then God calls him away to another battle and saves him at the rock of escape. He writes a song and says, God is greater. My God is greater. He's able to vindicate me. He's able to take care of my enemies. God is greater than my circumstances. Could you write that song? At the rock of escape, God is greater still. Even the waves in the wind still know his name. We sing it all the time. David sang it at the rock of escape. Here's what happens next. Because God's greater than his enemies, David doesn't have to take matters into his own hands. What if you were David and all of a sudden Saul is lying right in front of you asleep and you have the opportunity to take him out and become king? What would you do if all of a sudden God delivers your enemy right into your hands. That's what happened. David's in one of these caves. They've excavated, they found these caves uh, in Israel that hold up to 3,000 people, twice as big as this room. David and his men are in the back of this cave, 600 warriors. Who comes in for a little rest but Saul? Saul comes in for a little midday rest and he covers his feet with his robe and here's what David's Warriors say to him, behold, look, the day which the Lord has said to you, I'm about to give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. His own men make up a Bible verse because that's nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere did God ever say, I'm giving your enemy into your hand. You can do to him whatever you want. David's like, I don't think I remember that anywhere in the Bible, guys. You know what? David, instead of responding to a fake Bible verse, says to his men, he said to his men, far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord. He calls Saul, sleeping there in the cave, his Lord. Then he calls him the Lord's anointed one. Far be it for me to stretch out my hand against him. He is the Lord's anointed, man. David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up again against Saul or make up any more fake Bible verses. And Saul arose and left the cave and went on his way. You know what he's doing here? David is staying tight with God. He knows what God has said and he knows what God has not said. And you cannot pull one over on David. You cannot pull one over on David. He knows his God. He's praying to his God. And he knows what God has said and what God has not said. And God has said, 
you do not raise your hand against my anointed king. When it's time for him to go, I'll take care of him. I don't need your help. That's what God said to David. I don't need your help. I'll take care of it. So David, what he did do, and his conscience even bothered him at this. It says he snuck up with his knife and cut off the corner of Saul's robe and then went back in the cave. Now when Saul goes out his way and he's over on the other side of the hill with his 3,000 men, David shouts out, hey, Saul. And, David, and Saul's like, is that you, my son, David? And Yeah, and this is the corner of your robe right here in my hand. And Saul all of a sudden realizes that David and his men were in that cave. They could have taken him out. And he confesses that he's a fool. He confesses that he's sinning. He confesses that David will someday be king. And he promises to never chase him again, which he... He, he doesn't follow that through. He does chase him again. But at this point, he escapes narrowly from Saul. What song would you write right there? When you, when you escape from Saul with his men and, and, and he was at your feet and you could have taken him out and all your men are in the back of the cave saying, kill him, kill him, kill him. And you alone are saying, no, no, I'm not going to do it. What song would you write right there? Song number 142, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him. I tell him all my troubles. When I'm overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Because God, people are telling me to turn this way and that way and do this and do that, but you alone know the way I should turn. Whenever, wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come to help. No one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. But then I pray to you, O oh Lord. I say, you are my refuge. You are all I really want in life. Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors. They are too strong for me. Bring me out of the prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. What I take from this song is it when nobody else will help me, nobody else cares, nobody else gets me, nobody gives me a passing thought, nobody will help me, nobody cares a bit, nobody understands, God understands. God gets me, that's why I can call out to him, that's why I can pour out my troubles to him, because he does get me. He is a God who sees, he is a God who hears, he is a God who knows exactly where you're at and what you need, and you can call out to him no matter what everybody else is saying, or whether they get you or not, God gets you. He understands. And then you jump into chapter 25, and David almost loses it. He almost makes a mistake of his life in chapter 25. His faith is wearing thin, and I'll be honest with you, next week, he totally tanks. So David's doing great this week, but come back next week, he totally tanks. It's a really cool story next week, because we can all relate to people failing in their faith. His faith has a blowout next week. So come back. But this week, he almost has a faith blowout right here because what's happening, he's down in the south and Saul is gone for the time being. And David and his men are protecting the shepherds of this very wealthy guy named Nabal. And Nabal is a descendant of Caleb. If you remember Joshua and Caleb, the two heroes of Israel a ways back, he's a descendant of Caleb. He's an Israelite, he's a Jewish man, he's very wealthy, he's a powerful man in the south. David is protecting his shepherds. So it says, when we're introduced to Nabal, the man's name was Nabal, and his wife Abigail was a sensible and beautiful woman. Like my wife, sensible and beautiful. I get points for that. <laughs> Nabal was a crude and mean man in all of his dealings. That's not me, I'm not like that. Nabal's a fool, Abigail's a treasure. So David is protecting Nabal's shepherds and a feast day comes along. So David sends some men to Nabal asking if he could just graciously provide some food for the feast day. Instead, Nabal mocks David's men, scorns them, and says, you go ba back and tell that little rebel David there's plenty of people rebelling from their masters. Besides, he is of no significant origin. He's a nobody doing nothing. No, I will give him no food. So he humiliates David, which touches a deep wound in David. David had been humiliated by his, his older brother. He'd been humiliated by Saul. This touches a deep trigger. Here's where he almost loses it. 
David says this, surely in vain I've guarded all that this man has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him and now he's returned me evil for good. May God do so to the enemies of Israel or of David and more also if by morning I leave as much as one man of any who belong to him. He tells 400 of his warriors to get on their swords. We're on a mission. We are going to kill this man and his entire household. He almost lost it. He almost took vengeance into his own hand against an Israelite man. The one thing David will never do throughout his 10 years of wandering is he will never attack and kill Israelites. Because if he did, he would have made himself odious to the Israelites and they would have never allowed him to be the king. He is jeopardizing his entire future over anger because this fool has humiliated him. The only thing that stops him the only thing that stops him is Nabal's wise and discerning wife, Abigail. Now, women, I want you to know, from my wife to you, I want you to know that this story is the longest story in the Bible of a woman acting with wisdom in a crisis situation with two hot-headed fools. I want you to know, from my wife to you, she said this story has been inscripturated for a reason by the Holy Spirit, and the details are incredible. Her speech is, is a monument to godliness and dignity and humility and, and wisdom. Read this chapter. Study Abigail. It's absolutely incredible. She comes to David and gives an incredible speech, but she says to him, should anyone rise up to pursue you, David, and seek your life, then the life of my Lord will be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But David, the lives of your enemies, God is going to sling them out as from the hollow of a slink. And she even uses words and analogies David would have understood because David was good with a sling. And David knew what it was like to put a rock in a sling and go, whew, there goes the rock. And Abigail says, there goes your enemies. Whew, God will sling them out like a stone from a sling. But your life, David, you're bound up in the, in the bundle of the living God. She persuades him and backs him down from a disaster. And David says to Abigail, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has sent you. Woman, you are a godsend to me. Sent this day to meet me and blessed be your discernment. Blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. You know, David, if he had taken revenge on that man and killed that entire household, of workers and shepherds, they were all Israelites, he would never have been the king of Israel because you can't do that. You can't kill your own people and then become their king. In your notes on page 352, this is for you women. My, my wife, my Abigail, went through this story and she just picked out things about this woman that are incredible. I just want to read you a bullet point list and encourage you to study this story on your own. This woman knew her God. She was devout and yet she was humble. She respected her servants. She respected and protected the lives of her servants. She knew the character of her husband. She knew how to handle a foolish, arrogant, angry, drunkard man. She knew how to deal with Nabal. She knew how to approach David with respect and confidence. She called him my Lord. She reminded David of God's past faithfulness and God's promises for his future. She knew how to encourage godly behavior in others. She made David think through the consequences of his actions. She provided the food that David requested. She took the blame for Nabal's offense against David. She said, put it on my account, what he did. She inspired David to protect his own reputation in Israel. She affirmed that he would someday have a lasting dynasty. She assured David that his life was secure in God's hands. This is a great woman. <laughs> this is a great woman. So great that David married her. How did he marry her? She was already married. Well, when she went home and her husband was partying and drunk, she decided not to tell him that night what had just happened, how David had just, you know, was on the way to kill them all. So she waited till the morning when he was sober. And when he heard it, he went into shock, had some kind of a stroke, and 10 days later he died. Then David said, why don't you come be my wife? And he married this wise and discerning woman, Abigail. Great, great story. But it was, it, was, it was the one case in this section where David almost went out of line. He went, almost went AWOL. But it was a godly woman who came. There's two people that came during this period. Jonathan, his friend, 
undergirded his faith and strengthened him, and Abigail, a complete stranger, protected him from doing wrong. Great study, woman, uh, women. Abigail, a great, great study. And that may be what caused David in chapter 26 to not take Saul's life again, because Saul did come back. Saul did attack again. Saul brought his troops, and they're camping in this one place, and God causes a deep sleep to fall on Saul and all his warriors. And David sneaks into the camp with his key warrior, Abishai, and Abishai says, let me do it. Let me do it. You won't do it, but let me take him out for us. Here's what it reads in chapter 26. Abishai says to David, today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now, therefore, please let me strike him with the spear to the ground. One stroke. I won't have to hit him two times. He's trying to persuade him. I'll do it. I know you won't. Let me do it. David said, do not. Do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord anointed and be without guilt? And David also said, look, here's the Lord. As he lives, he can, he can strike him, or his day will come that he dies, or he'll go down into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but now I'll take the spear that's at his head and take the jug of water and let's go. Do you see what David did? He says to Abishai, look, God doesn't need my help. God doesn't need me to step out of line and help him accomplish his plan a little bit. God has plenty of tools. The guy can grow old and die. God could strike him dead. Oh, and by the way, that just happened to Nabal. <laughs> Struck dead. God could send him into a battle and he might die that way. And that's what actually happened in 1 Samuel 31. He goes out into battle and dies. But David said something very wise. He said to his buddy, look, you don't need a crowbar to open a door that God has in front of you. You don't need a crowbar to get where God is taking you. You don't need to force things. You can trust God and let God and his timing have his way. I find this to be incredible faith. I, it's probably inspired by Abigail. It's probably inspired by Jonathan's encouragement and David's times with the Lord, but here he had an opportunity to take him out and he didn't do it. He does take, he takes the water jug and the spear, and again, when Saul gets to the other side of the hill, he holds up the water jug and spear and says, hey, Saul, who's water jug and spear? And Saul goes, I am a complete idiot. I'm a complete fool. You are righteous, I am not. You're gonna be king someday, I will not. I will no longer pursue you, and that is the end of the pursuit right there. This is the end of David ever seeing Saul again, ever seeing him again. Saul said, I've sinned, return my son David. I will not harm you again because my life was precious in your sight this day. Behold, I've played the fool, committed a serious error. Blessed are you, my son David. You will both accomplish much and you will surely prevail. Those are the final words that Saul ever spoke to David. You will prevail. Never saw each other again. What song would you write right there? What song would you write when you had a second chance to kill him and you didn't? And he says goodbye, but you know he's betrayed you a whole bunch of times. He'll probably come back again. You're thinking, what song would you write? Song number 57. Have mercy on me, oh God, have mercy. God, I look to you for protection. I'm gonna hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. I cry out to God most high, to God, who will fulfill his purpose for me. You will fulfill your purpose for me. No matter what people say, no matter what happens, no matter how close the escapes, you will fulfill your purpose for me. You will send help from heaven to rescue me. You will disgrace those who hound me. You will send forth your unfailing love and faithfulness. I'm surrounded by fierce lions who greedily devour human prey. Their teeth are like spears and arrows. Their tongues cut like swords. But you, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth, for your unfailing love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. I learned from that song that if we are willing, if we're willing to just give our deserts to God, give our struggles, our trials, our enemies, if we're willing to give all of that to God instead of taking it and trying to manage it and fix it, if we can just keep giving it to God, he can be exalted in our deserts. He can be. 
This was a period of time, 14, 15, 16 years for David, and yet he's crying out, writing a song, be exalted, O God, be exalted above the heavens through my life. I want to show you a, a video that I asked some people in San Diego to record just, just as a last minute thought this week. These people helped us at the beginning of this church, Barb and Rick, and they've been through a 17 year nightmare. 17 year nightmare of, of being accused, being betrayed, being let down, being impoverished, not being able to see his two boys all the way through the last 18 years of this church, they've been deprived of him seeing his boys, a nightmare. And yet, as you watch this video, I asked him just to get in front of a computer and record it, so it's not very high tech, but you'll see him saying, we have chosen to let God be exalted in our desert. Watch this story. Good morning. Today I've been asked to share a small part of my journey with you and some of the lessons I've learned through the years. My wife filed for a divorce in 1997, and soon after it became very clear that she wanted me out of her and our son's lives forever, and my sons were ages four and seven at the time. In February of 1999, I found out that my ex-wife had filed for something they call an ex parte PPO against me, which is, I didn't even have to be there. She went to a judge, said she was fearful that I might kidnap my sons, um, and the PPO precluded me from being with my sons, contacting them in any way for four years. I won't go into detail on my case, but there was no justice or help to be found in the family court system. I was surrounded by darkness, politics, lies, and deception. It was really the most vivid spiritual battle I've ever been involved in. Um, in the end, after four long years, it was $150,000 in legal fees, three different legal firms trying to help me being forcefully kept from my sons. They had assigned a psychologist to our case to help my sons. And uh, at the end, he said that in his assessment that my ex-wife had successfully alienated my sons from me. My sons believed I had voluntarily abandoned them and that they were so poisoned they now hated me. Those are the facts, but the facts aren't the journey, are they? This was a defining moment in my life, defining time in my life. I love my sons more than anyone on the face of the earth, and I would do anything I could to protect them. Um, I was forced to deal with intense feelings of betrayal, anger, and outrage over the injustice of it all. Who would protect my sons from the insanity and evil being perpetrated against them? Who would make things right and hold these people accountable? How could God allow evil to triumph over good, lies over truth. And what about all those promises in his word about the blessings promised to a godly man and family? Were they still true? I made a decision that regardless of whether God ever answered those questions for me, I would trust him and follow him no matter what. No matter how badly I wanted to hold these people accountable, and trust me when I tell you, I really wanted to hold them accountable, I would leave justice in his hands and timing. It's been 17 years and there's not a day that goes by that I don't feel the pain and loss of my sons. But I know that they're in his hands and he loves them even more than I do. I also know that God has a plan. In Psalm 139, it says that all the days of our life were recorded in the book before we were ever born. Those days are still being lived with a definite purpose in mind. The Old Testament, I think that all too often we as Christians believe that God exists for us. He's there to meet our needs, that we are the point, when in fact it's just the opposite. We are here to serve and honor him and his plan for mankind. The Old Testament reveals that Jacob had no idea what God had planned for his son Joseph. I choose to believe the same thing applies to my sons. God has a plan for them that I know nothing about, and I will trust them with him. I look at every day that I had with my sons as a precious gift from his hand. You may notice I continue to say choose instead of feel. All of us have intense feelings in a time of crisis, but we still need to choose to submit to the Lord's plan for our life and choose to follow him even when he doesn't do what we want him to. Although things haven't always been easy, I'm a very blessed man. God has blessed me with an incredibly godly wife that he brought into my life shortly after our sons, uh, I lost them. 
She's been through almost all of this with me. We'll be celebrating our 17th anniversary in July of this year. We have two beautiful daughters, seven grandchildren, and friends and family all across the country, and we live in sunny San Diego. In 2008, Barb and I felt led to start a ministry helping people that had been involved in high-conflict divorces and parental alienation like we had. We put up a website called Families Keep, Keeping Families Connected, and to date, we've been visited by people from every state of the United States in over 176 different countries. We've ministered to people of almost every religion, including Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and many atheists. We've also led divorce care groups at several different churches. God continues to use our site to bring healing and hope through the resources we have listed on the site. God used the pain that we've been through as a door of ministry to those that come to us in their brokenness and grief. It's not a pretty part of ministry, but it's a very needed one. The great news is the best is yet to come. We live in precarious but exciting times. My wife and I believe that we're very close to seeing the return of the King and we can't wait. Until then, be blessed. 17 years, 17 years without your boys. We have pictures, Shirley, Shirley was showing me last night of him with his little boys when they were two, three years old. Still hasn't seen them. Still poisoned against him. Still as adults think that he was the whole problem. How do you trust God during those kinds of deserts, those circumstances. Like he said, it's a choice. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. That's a choice from a cave. May your glory shine over all the earth. That's a choice from the desert. Your unfailing love is as high as the heavens. That's a choice from the wilderness of Ziff. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Oh, that's a choice. Be exalted, O oh God, above the heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. I don't know what you're going through today, but what I'd like to do is take those final words right there. I don't know if you're aware of it, but those have been made into a very famous worship song that we sing all the time. Third Day created a song from those very words, and what I want you to do is you just watch the words on screen. You can sing if you want. You can just listen to the music video. You can pray the words, but I want you to realize these words were written during the period of time we just discussed. It's possible to find joy in God, even in the desert. All those words were written in the desert, in the cave, by the rock of escape, being betrayed, wondering where God is, how God could be good. Isn't it amazing? You can sing those words. We can if we choose to find our joy in him instead of in our circumstances. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Father, right now you know what every one of us is going through. You know the trials, you know the, the faith that is wavering, you know the deserts we're in, the caves, you know if we've been betrayed or our back is against the wall, you know if we've been maligned you know, if we've lost everything, you know the details. And God, I pray that you would teach us to find our shelter in the shadow of your wings, to sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. God, would you give us the strength to do that, to trust you even when we don't know the answers, to believe in you when we see no hope. And God, would you just be exalted in our lives, no matter what, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.